Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the fourth Sunday of Advent on December 19th, 2021, are these, Micah 5, 2 through 5a. The psalm is Luke 1, 46b through 55. There's an alternate Psalm 81 through 7. Hebrews 10, 5 through 10. And then from the gospel, according to Luke chapter 1, 39 through 45, or here you can add 46 through 55, which is the psalm reading. We will explain it all. Yes. Yeah, so... It is Luke 1. Hmm? It, nevertheless, it is Luke chapter 1. Not a bad pairing as uh, Advent starts to wind up and the sounds and smells of Christmas are near. But we've also had, you know, prophets. We had Jesus offering prophecy about what's to come on Advent 1. We've had John prophesying in Advent 2 and 3. And now we get Mary prophesying. And in a way, we also get John as a fetus doing some prophesying as well inside of his mother. So this whole Advent theme of Luke and prophecy is, uh, is, is coming, to, uh, coming to its fullness here. Well, and in particular, prophecy from uh, persons that you would not necessarily expect. And so, in, and in particular here, Elizabeth, who offers a, a, a really a blessing, a beatitude on Mary. It's, of course, where we get the Hail Mary, which I know very well. I had to memorize in many different forms and mediums when I went to San Domenico School for Girls back in the day. So I can sing it in Latin for you if you'd like. I can say it in Latin for you. So I'm good on my Hail Marys. Uh, but it is a, it's a beautiful moment in the story overall where you have these separate stories that have happened, of course, since the beginning of, of the gospel with Elizabeth and then with Mary. And here's where these stories collide. Here's where these stories unite of Elizabeth and Mary. And their role, I think, as you mentioned, that in this prophetic moment is, is really interesting in, and, and really poignant in that they are both making these prophetic claims about God's activity. And, and at the same time, the way in which that, that prophecy leads to a kind of more prophecy uh, a more a, a responsive prophecy, and so you have Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth making this claim about who you know who the the child that that Mary is carrying, and the blessedness of Mary, and this and, and again sort of a return to her own blessedness that now the mother of the Lord has come to her as well as God has already come to her, and to what extent you can see the Magnificat as a as a as a prophetic response to that prophecy. I mean, that's one way you can think about the Magnificat. So I, I find that to be really powerful, the way in which prophetic speech leads to more prophetic speech, that there's an empowerment in there, that, uh, that Mary is in part empowered or inspired to speak her own prophetic speech her own hymn of praise because of Elizabeth. And so there's a mutuality and a reciprocity that I don't know that we think about very much when it comes to uh, prophetic acts. You, you made me remember that from um, my Catholic uh, uh, high school, I learned um, uh, the Hail Mary in Spanish. And um, I hope my, um, my, my uh, Spanish teacher isn't listening to this because I certainly don't remember how to do it in Spanish anymore so that you can do it. Latin impresses me. Um, but uh, when I was reading this this time, one of the things I was just noting is how important song really is for a community uh, in terms of sharing uh, its story uh, and remembering uh, what's important. Uh, and so uh, we talk about Mary's song. Um, I of, often like to remember that uh, Miriam um, uh, gave the report of the acts of God uh, 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 when she was with her brothers, uh, Aaron and Moses. And it was Miriam's song. And now we have Mary's song again, rehearsing, uh, 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 anticipating, um, to use that word in, in this season, but also just a recognition of what it means to carry the songs from a generation ago 
into the, the next generation. Um, uh, we think of uh, uh, the, the classic songs that we sing during this season that uh, some people start to sing uh, too early for me. Uh, I'm, I'm one of those people that likes to wait to hold the Christmas songs to Christmas and to actually lean in with some of the Advent expectation songs that we don't know, but that actually uh, are, are filled with the promise of waiting. And then um, how do we take those songs, that those, those lyrics that rehearse for us our story from the past and pass them on so that the next generation recognizes them, uh, so that the next gen generation appreciates them, um, so that they don't become in a pejorative way elevator music but that, that they become, okay, this is totally personal and it's kind of random, but I had problems going into uh, uh, like um, a Home Depot uh, because Home Depot always plays uh, like 80s music. And so I kind of dance around Home Depot filling up my cart. And I have to remember to stop singing so I can stop buying and get out of there. Um, that's different than how I think of uh, pejorative to elevator music, like it's, oh, it's that song again. How do we get folks to hear these songs, uh, these ancient prophecies in a way that speaks into our present day expectation of God showing up uh, with promise and peace in the midst of our hurts today? I mean, I think one way, that's a good question. I think one way we do that is to invite people to see these as, as invitations to, uh, to rewrite them yourself or to, to reenact them uh, for yourself. Um, one of the things I love, I probably say this every three years, one of the things I love about the Magnificat is that it begins with Mary talking about herself, uh, begins praising God for the way God has, has recognized who she is. And Mary's not a prophet who had her lips touched with a coal or who saw a burning bush and received a specific commission. She's a prophet in the sense that the Holy Spirit has come upon her and we could, we could talk enunciation and we could talk conception uh, if we wanted to, but the reality is there's something about the way this, this spills forth from her own body, from something deep within her. And so I love that it begins with her recognizing that God has shown favor to her, that she's going to have a bit of a reputation going forward here in a positive way, right? All generations will call me blessed. And then from there, she moves on to deeper reflection, or maybe I should say broader reflection about who God is and how God acts in the world. Uh, Wes Allen in his commentary says, there's no, there's no individual salvation here apart from an advent of Jesus Christ that also turns the world's power structures on its head. So Mary begins with this obscure, humble experience of her own that most of her neighbors would have said, you're nuts, uh, and turns that into a piece of a larger, all cosmos encompassing uh, work of God, which, so when I say we invite people into that, it's to imagine similar things, right? Where does your own experience of God tie into the, 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 the long-running confession of a God who uh, does all the things that Mary talks about or is committed to doing the things that Mary talks about that are utterly um, upending. I want to go back to, well, yes, and, and Rolf, you have a, uh, your, your commentary on the psalm, <laughs> which is, uh, of course, the Magnificat. I mean, one of the things that I really appreciated about that commentary is are a couple of things that we've already talked about that Luke's, this theme of Luke uh, of praise, praise as a response, singing as a response, and the way in which she stands in that wider history of Miriam, Hannah, and also Deborah that uh, we see in her response, uh, her carrying on that that reality or that that response to what God has done and and that that invites our own and so she she stands in this this you know this history or this trajectory of what of what responses what a response to God's favor sounds like and looks like and of course that's a theme that will be continued 
uh, throughout work, uh, throughout the Gospel of Luke. But uh, in particular, your commentary, Rolf, with regard to uh, thinking of Mary's psalm as a radical Advent carol, that uh, the way in which, you know, the way in which Magnificat has the Magnificat, I don't know if we want to say get tamed, but it's, we have this, and I'm going to talk about this more when we get to Christmas, but we have this picture of Mary as being rather docile and, and receptive, and that this is a really, this is an act of both uh, praise and prophecy, and, and putting herself out there, as you said, Matt, like putting her own body on the line to make this claim about who God is and what God has done for her. And so I think a recapturing of that, I don't know, maybe riskiness of, of what she's doing here is, is something to which we are invited in this, in this Advent season as well. And particularly as we move forward into Christmas, are we willing to claim the the radicalness of Christmas, the the upendingness of Christmas. I think that's what one of the one of the ways you can think of a transition between the fourth Sunday of Advent and then moving into Christmas. So thank you for your commentary, Rolf. Uh, you're welcome. One of the things I really liked, uh, what um, you know, one of the things I've learned uh, from our work and in, in this podcast over the years uh, from Matt is the way that the Holy Spirit saturates the early chapters of Luke. And I've come then to think about, I think we mainly think about the fulfillment of the prophecy in Joel, you know, um, the Holy Spirit will be pour, poured out upon all, you know, young and old, male and female, you know, um, slaves. Um, it's not just fulfilled in Acts 2, that, that promise from Joel, it's fulfilled here uh, as well first prior and then second like you said um i think a lot of people do associate correctly the magnificat with hannah's song in first samuel 2 but it's also it also should be associated with miriam's song and deborah's song one of the things i really liked about um wes allen's commentary on the website was uh okay this is you know, this isn't going to preach really well in most places, um, you know, his, to his attention to the aorist verbs in the Magnificat, that that prophetically, uh, Mary is able to say all these things have already happened, you know, God has done these things, that is God has done the things God is going to do in Jesus, because um, the incarnation has already begun, essentially. I'd say they've already happened and they keep on happening. But I, That's I think, good. I think this is a gnomic aorist if we want to like really bore people on the fourth Sunday of Advent. where uh, That makes me so happy. How do you spell gnomic? Is that like G-N-O-M-I-C. Like the little, the, the little, the little gnomes, garden gnomes. The yeah. Little, uh, uh, Norwegian Nissa garden gnomes that are all over my house on Advent. There you go. Well, and my I sister and brother-in-law that. live in Gnome Town, Dawson, Minnesota. It's called Gnome Town. You, know, you just drive in and there's all we these have, little notes. We've really derailed Matt now, Carolyn. I knew I was making a mistake there, yeah. Uh, the the errors can help. also be used to describe customary habitual actions. So uh, sometimes you hear sermons or read commentaries where people try to like identify each of these things with a particular Old Testament story. I think that's the wrong way of reading it. It's more like she's saying, here's a character sketch of the God who's at work today. This is the kind of stuff this God habitually does or regularly does. Um, which is also that that preaches don't use the word gnomic in your sermons this Sunday. If you do, don't use my name. Oh, do. I do. I, I challenge all of our listeners who are <laughs> preachers and not all of them uh, preach every Sunday. I challenge you to get the word gnomic in there. Gnomic. And I want to know how it goes over. <laughs> yeah. Or gnome town. Anyway, gnome let's, town. let's talk. Let's talk briefly about uh, a logistical issue. Um, Obviously, the Magnificat comes at the end of this gospel passage, but usually psalms are sung before the gospel is read. Uh, I think the four of us would say, go ahead and sing the song after you read the gospel. Some people are going to say, we can't do that in my tradition, but I suppose you could sing the psalm later yes. on, read the gospel. Yes. With this. I, but I would suggest make a case for why it has to be sung in some way, shape or form. I, I would I would suggest singing it uh, at the point of the psalm and then reading it 
as part of the gospel to contextualize it narratively. Is there any reason at all somebody should choose Psalm 81 through 7? We didn't even put a commentary on our website, I don't think. I can find commentaries on our website <laughs> on that in other years. But what a time, right, to open this up and to say that this is more about just reporting on Mary's experience prior to the birth of Jesus, but this is also um, something that should have an effect, right, that should, should usher us into not just praise, but prophecy as well. So what about... Oh, oh, oh. Uh, I'm sorry, I you have go one ahead. More, yeah, I have one more comment about, about Elizabeth. <laughs> and uh, because that, yeah, I think one of the things that is challenging is when you have the Magnificat, it's, you know, it's so beautiful and, and the attraction to Mary. But I want to point out a couple of things about Elizabeth before we move on. Uh, the first is the way in which she really does significantly and importantly set up or introduce or makes possible Mary's uh, makes possible Mary's Magnificat in that blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And what I find really fascinating about that is that she is rather ambiguous. Is it, is she talking about herself or is she talking about Mary? And, and the way in which, uh, the way in which she, you know, leads that she has experienced a fulfillment in this collision with Mary in this conversation with Mary, and now Mary will speak about that as well. And then also the, how is it that she's able to, to speak this beatitude to Mary, blessed are you among women to what extent it's because she has already felt, she has already experienced that blessedness. And I think that could be an interesting homiletical direction that, that uh, blessedness, that experience of blessedness and to be blessed and to be favored uh, in this regard. And, and that's one of the ways I would think about what does blessed, what, what does it mean to be blessed, blessed here? How does that then change your perspective? in terms of your capacity to see the favor of others or the blessedness of others and uh, the way in which that changes how you move about uh, in the world. So those two other comments about uh, homiletical directions for, for this marvelous, beautiful passage. Is there a significance in that given that we're talking about two women who are at almost opposite ends of the lifespan? Uh, Elizabeth really, really wanted a child as far as we can tell. Mary might not have wanted to, not yet, <laughs> given her yeah. age and experience. Yeah. But I mean that there's, these are not, and this is not Elizabeth coming down and bowing down before Mary in some no. way. This is Elizabeth mm -hmm. in some ways almost mentoring in this prophetic moment, as well as John already bearing what, I mean, it's just an interesting yeah. scene in terms of yeah. the contrasts. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I usually try to psychologize biblical characters as much as possible, but come on, it's fourth Sunday of Advent in this story, but there's something going on in the relationship here and in Absolutely. the generational difference. And I don't think mentoring is the right word, but it's close to what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. I think there's a kind of, um, there's a kind of mm, mutual knowing uh, that that's hard to, it's even hard to describe a kind of uh, connection between these two women, as you said, one, one barren and wanting a child and experiencing that shame and that Mary, to what extent some of that is going to be her experience as well. So there's so many overlapping connections that connect these women. And I think, uh, I think it is, it's a really beautiful moment in scripture. So it, it points to that, that the, the, capa the, the way in which God enters into your life and how that then brings you into connection with others and particularly here to women, which you don't see very often. So I, um, so much to explore there, I think. Um, I wonder if there's a portion of that that is just uh, um, a cultural for that time for that intergenerational um, um, sharing, uh, to just be a part of the reality there, the, uh, the way that um, uh, family units worked then, um, more extended than you know, just our um, contemporary nuclear family. 
yeah, it sounds strange to a lot of us because of how we right. live. But, um, but of course, might not have been in that setting. Yeah. Uh, we say a few words but, about Micah. We should. A good chance to teach about Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's history. It's location. Yeah, and Maggie yeah, O'Dell's commentary humanity. is beautiful. In the and uh, and and also the um, uh, the recognition uh, that was already made uh, in terms of. Uh, I, I think Ralph was making this in terms of the, uh, the Joel prophecy, the least, uh, the smallest plan, the least expected um, is, is this comes to, uh, uh, to reality again. Uh, it, it's another place where the promise becomes the present. I highly encourage uh, folks to, to read um, Maggie O'Dell's commentary on the website, which is you know, characteristically excellent. Um, so, because she takes, uh, I think she takes um, the text in the right direction. You know, first of all, to recognize that this is spoken in the eighth century um, BCE. One of my, uh, one, one of my beliefs about the, the prophetic literature is that um, each of the prophets was included because some uh the collections of their saying were included primarily first because one thing they said which was uh really surprising um proved to be true and for micah that was that um, jerusalem would fall now jerusalem did not fall for another 150 years after micah but um micah was a prophet from a small town outside of jerusalem and Micah's anger at Jerusalem, he calls it, you know, the high place of Judah and says it will become a desolation. His anger is because the, the rulers in Judah um, caused wars to fall upon Judah, especially Hezekiah. Um, and the people in the small towns outside of Jerusalem paid the price so that when Sennacherib came and invaded, this is not material, probably for a sermon in most places, but it's good to know. Um, so you know, I, Isaiah and Hezekiah, they're safe in Jerusalem, the, the great walled city up on the hill, uh, built into bedrock, so so difficult to overcome. But all the little people in places like Bethlehem uh, really paid the price for the arrogance uh, uh, in Jerusalem. And so I, I connect that then just, you know, th thematically with what we've been saying about Luke 1 uh, and how the reversals that are going to be coming and so when he says, listen, a ruler is going to come uh, there, because there is no king in Jerusalem, uh, and that ruler is going to come from Bethlehem like David originally did come. And, uh, and you know, you can see from there where Mike is going. Well, Hebrews isn't ordinarily how I would choose to celebrate Christmas, but uh, there's a great commentary here um, from, from, from Daniel Kirk, which... which um, I'm not sure I'd bring this into the pulpit in the fourth Sunday of Advent, but it's really good to think about the ways in which uh, Jesus brings about an utter reorientation towards scripture. He's got this line, Jesus changes everything, even what scripture means, um, which is, we should have preached on that at the start of Advent, perhaps, to help people think about some of the, the polyvalence of these Old Testament texts, to help people think about what it means to read them through a Christological lens while still respecting what they once meant, while still respecting how our Jewish siblings interpret the texts. Uh, but talking about how you know, Hebrews is a lot of things, <laughs> but one of the things that book is, is a, is a really, in some ways, playful, in some ways, a little bit kooky, but in other ways, uh, just a thoroughly reoriented way of reading scripture in light of Christ. Um, which, you know, again, you don't want a sermon about hermeneutics and how best to read the Bible uh, at this time of year, but you do need to talk about that reorientation. You need to talk about perspective being changed, about old wisdom being transformed uh, to, to take on a new look or to take on a new relevance or a new radicalism. So, I, yeah, I, I read the Hebrews text and I was like, no one's going to preach on this. And then I read Daniel Kirk and I thought, this is really important stuff to think about.
You're all not, I mean, people can't see your faces if they're not watching on YouTube, but all three of them are nodding. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, well Enjoy said. Luke one. <laughs> Happy fourth advent.